he says that all football clubs should pay. Handing out leaflets at Arsenal Stadium, this is not where you'd expect to find the leader of Her Majesty's opposition. But Jeremy Corbyn promised a very different sort of politics. His difficulty, of course, is that in some ways he is now part of the political elite himself. More with Sophie now in our Westminster studio. Uh, Sophie, what's adding even more political spice to this is the fact that the Shadow Defence Secretary, Maria Eagle, says she sees nothing wrong with General Horton's comments and echoed his concerns indeed uh, about Trident. Well, in many ways, this is Jeremy Corbyn's new politics in action. Trident is an issue in which there is some extreme difference of uh, opinion around that shadow cabinet table and in fact he disagrees uh, with his shadow defense secretary on the matter maria eagle uh, actually said very strongly as you say mark that she thinks that it's okay for the chief of the defense staff to speak his mind in public that he can say what he likes effectively and that his views are something that she personally agrees with as well so this all came before that statement was put out by jeremy corbyn the leader of the labor party in which he took a very different view uh, from Maria Eagle, saying that in, in his view it was political interference and it compromised the neutrality of the uh, military, and that's why he's written to the Ministry of Defence about it. But what is, what is the, the state, or status, I should say, of the political consensus on the military keeping their nose out of political matters? Well, what it feels like uh, is that it's a bit of a split. So Crispin Blunt, who is a Conservative, someone who you wouldn't accept, expect to be supporting Jeremy Corbyn on this, he says that he thinks he's got a point that the military should butt out. And then you've got Maria Eagle, who, as a member of the Shadow Cabinet, you would assume would support her leader, saying that she is quite relaxed about the idea of them airing their views. It will be an interesting test, the response to Jeremy Corbyn's letter, because this is something that hasn't really uh, been looked at in too much detail before and it'll be interesting to see how Philip Hammond and also the department themselves uh, choose to respond uh, to Jeremy Corbyn's concerns. We shall wait and see. For the moment, Sophie, thanks very much. And Straw, the former Foreign Secretary, uh, to appear in front of this committee. We've had people on the Conservative side calling for that to happen with Michael Fallon, but also on the Labour side with uh, Tessa Jowell and also the former Home Secretary, Alan Johnson, saying that they think that they should uh, be questioned uh, on this. Uh, now, there's nothing that the committee has to compel them to attend, but at the same time, because of the mounting public pressure, I would say it would be very uh, risky for somebody to deny uh, the invitation. Uh, Jack Straw has already told Sky News that he would be delighted to give evidence in front of the committee. But it's important to say as well, this isn't just a matter for previous administrations, because of course there will be questions for the current government over these redactions that were, of course, requested, now we know, uh, by the UK government related to matters of national security in the UK, they say, not to the involvement of British personnel. But at the same time, if Sir Malcolm Rifkin is calling on uh, the US to give this information to his committee so he can have a look at it, well, many people will be asking, hang on a minute, hasn't the UK government seen it as well? Shouldn't they be the ones to tell him? OK, Sophie, thank you. Sophie Ridge in Westminster. And came here to Russell Brown's house. And that is the point. The man who wants to be Prime Minister went to visit the comedian, not the other way round. Perhaps that says something about where the real power lies. Hard to talk about female voters without resorting to cliché. Not all women care about childcare, for instance. Some are more worried about the economy. But if you're dealing in generalisations, then women are more likely to be undecided. And that is why they matter to politicians. Uh, to be so close. So that's, that's comforting. The other thing uh, about that slide, though, is that Labour's vote has collapsed down mm. to 17 percentage points, uh, and the Liberal Democrats, they are barely showing there. And mm. as Adam remarked uh, immediately after the result, that is a new record, uh, a record that you don't want uh, as a political party. That's their lowest vote share uh, in any uh, parliamentary by-election. Yeah, just 0.9%. I think we can show as well the way that the vote share has changed uh, in this uh, by-election compared to the last time that there was an election here. UKIP obviously in purple there going up 42.1%. Everybody else really has gone down. And look at that Liberal Democrat vote there, as you were just saying, down 15.4%, less than 1%. I mean, that's got to be bad news for them. This is the, the story, really, of, of Rochester and Clacton and other by-elections that we've seen in this parliament. It's UKIP's... Uh, dramatic rise uh, because they didn't contest this uh, at the, the last general election and they're doing this in local council by-elections they come from nowhere 
and taking a, a significant uh, share of the vote, but they're taking votes from the other three parties. So this really is uh, a case of mm. fighting against the party establishment. Thanks very much for that analysis. Um, back to you now, uh, Adam. Thank you. This is the real difference between by-elections now and those even a few years ago because social media has become a pretty big factor. Already we've had lots of reaction to the result that people have been tweeting about, particularly, of course, a bad result for, uh, to the Liberal Democrats perhaps not doing as well uh, as could be expected. So that seems to be what the kind of main themes are in social media. It's back to you, Adam.